Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kenny Guro from the Embedded and Reconfigurable Computing Group here in Research Redmond. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Lewis Woods. Uh, Lewis is a third year graduate student at ETH Zurich, and he also used to be one of our uh, interns here. His uh, research interests include uh, FPGAs in the context of modern databases, parallel algorithms, and stream processing and pattern matching. Uh, and with that, Lewis. Thanks, Ken, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for coming. So uh, this, the work that I'm going to present is joint work together with uh, Jens Teubner and Chongling Ni from the Systems Group in ETH Zurich. And uh, the, the title of this work is Skeleton Automata for FPGAs Reconfiguring Without Reconstructing. So let me just uh, start with a very brief introduction to FPGAs. Um, I know many of you know what they are, but um, I like to think of them as soft hardware. So soft in the sense that you can change them after manufacturing, but you know, once they are programmed, they behave like real hardware. And uh, so they consist of conceptually of these two layers, uh, a logic layer, which is just a pool of hardware resources, um, an uncommitted pool, and then a configuration layer on top, which allows you to um, you know, define how these hardware resources interact and, and together construct the real circuit. And um, so by, by software update, uh, the behavior of a circuit, or actually really the, the, the layout of the circuit, can be changed. Now, in, in my research, I am particularly interested how these um, types of, of, of hardware um, can be used in, in database systems. Um, so how can data processing systems um, benefit from this, and one question is the question of, you know, how do you integrate it into an existing system? Do you use it as a coprocessor where you load data over there um, to do a lot of number crunching on it, or do you do something like I'm proposing here, where you say you integrate it in an existing data path? So this data path could be the network, or it could be the uh, direct link to storage, and uh, you can take a chip and put it into this path um, and have it process in a streaming manner the data as it flows through to the CPU anyway. So for instance, as I show in, the, in this example, uh, you could use it to maybe pre-filter um, a lot of data or you could use it um, to you know, do pre-computation or auxiliary computation on the data as the data flows by. So how, how is the work between CPU and FPGA divided? Um, you know, the, the goal is to extract the parts of, of your program which the FPGA can handle efficiently. Um, but these are probably rather, rather simple things. You still need the GPU because it's much more flexible. Um, you, you still, in, in a full-blown query engine, um, you, you cannot offload everything to the FPGA. So, so the, the, the key challenge sort of is how do you make this separation um, for this to work well? So there, there, um, there has been some research on using FPGAs for databases and there are also some commercial systems that do this. So at the one end, I want to sort of present two, two extremes in a sense. On the one hand, there is something like this Glacier compiler. Um, Glacier uh, was developed in our group a while back, and is a, is a query to hardware compiler. Um, so you give this thing an, alge an, an alge algebraic query plan, and it translates this into a circuit um, defined in a hardware description language, such as Verilog or VHDL. Then, however, you, you cannot put this directly on the FPGA. You have to do a number of steps on it, such as synthesis, place, and route, to map the circuit you define to the particular FPGA device. Um, and 
this takes some time. This is not something that you can do on the fly. Um, so, so this approach here works well in, in, for instance, a streaming scenario where you have long-running standing queries which you want to have implemented in hardware. Let's say you're in a, in a netru in, um, network intrusion detection system and you have certain patterns you want to detect on, on a data stream. Uh, so, so you might have new patterns you know, as time evolves which you want to put on there on a nightly, ba on a, you know, on a nightly basis or on a weekly basis, but, but not very frequently. So at the other end, there are systems like Netisa, which are, Netisa is a data warehouse appliance um, which also uses FPGAs um, inside its architecture. And here you don't compile query, full queries into hardware, but you rather put a fixed set of operations um, in, in, onto the FPGA. So things as decompressing data efficiently to speed up transfer times between disk and, and, the, and, and the final system, or uh, you can do simple filtering of data such as projection-based or restriction or, or selection-based filtering. Um, you can do that type of stuff. But it's a very, so it's, it's a, you, you don't fully compile queries, you, you just do a, a little bit of it and the more complex stuff will be done on the CPU. And so the work I'm going to present here is, is um, about this type of filtering done on XML using a technique called XML projection. Um, this technique extracts filtering expressions from a query and then pre-filters the data before the final X query engine then runs on a reduced set of data. And the goal of this work is that we, we don't want to have the compilation overhead, uh, which we saw in Glacier, and yet we want to make this filtering as expressive as possible. So we don't want to just simply filter uh, you know, on columns or so. We have here a more, more complex problem where we really want to have, sorry, yeah? So uh, could you give us a little more details on the compilation on that? For example, like, uh, joint query or some benchmark query from TPCH benchmark. So how, how long does it typically take in the Glacier framework to generate all that? Okay, so, um, so if you do the full compilation, um, this will take definitely several minutes and then it depends of course how, how, how complex uh, your circuit is, then it can even take um, hours, but, but it will definitely take uh, a number of minutes. But, but Yes. So you you so the, you run you run through an optimizer and get a plan. Yes. And Glazer takes as input a final physical plan and translates it to VHD. Yes. And then there's a cost of uh, so and that is one part. And the second is taking a VHD program and constructing the right. Circuit. So so the compilation that first part is not not an issue, but but the, the second part is the issue because the the complicated thing is you're now taking an abstract circuit description, and you have to translate it to the to the to the hardware which the FPGA provides you, and you have to do the routing, and this is a, a really it's a complicated process. So this is not something that you could do that that that, that you can do efficiently. No. So so yeah, if, so from 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 Verilog or VHDL to Bitstream and loading the Bitstream also on the FPGA, that's a process which takes um, um, quite some time. So the alternative is to not reprogram the FPGA, but to just you know, have a generic circuit which you can modify um, the way you like. So um, I think I have to give now next, I'm going to give an introduction to what is XML projection. Um, I already highlighted the idea a little bit, but let's run through an example. So here I have an XML document and um, on the right hand side I have a, an X query. So this X query, what it does, it uh, from this document basically selects all the item elements which are descendants of the region elements and it then returns for each of those items, it returns a new item. You can do this in X query like this. You can generate a new item which contains 
the name tag which matched. So the name with all of the, the entire subtree of name. Here it's just a, a text foo, but it could be entire subtree. And it generates uh, num categories, uh, new element num categories, which contains an aggregate, which is just the count of these two in category elements. Okay? So we say, okay, this is a complex query, which, I mean, xQuery is a, is a very complex language, and we cannot run this full query on an FPGA. However, in uh, 2003, uh, there was a paper by Marion and Simeon who um, talked about a, a technique for projecting XML documents. And they showed that you can actually, from any query, infer uh, statically a set of so-called projection paths. Yeah? These are, this is a subset of X paths used to express these paths, and these paths define exactly which parts in the document will be um, touched by the query. So you can actually, before you run this query, you can quickly extract this path and then filter out all of the irrelevant parts um, of the document. And then you can run the X query on the, on the final filtered um, result in the uh, document and it will give you the same result. So if we take this idea to our hybrid architecture, which I'm proposing, then um, the server running a full-blown X query engine, such as Saxon or uh, MX query or you name it, uh, before it runs the XQuery engine, it extracts these paths and puts them on the FPGA. And this has to happen, obviously, quick enough for, for this approach to make sense. And then the data is streamed not directly to the FPGA, or it's, 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 it's uh, not, not directly to the server, but it's streamed through the FPGA. And the idea is that the FPGA really operates as a stream processor in the network, which uh, just reads on the one end the original document and on the other end produces the filtered document. Yeah. That's, that's the key idea. So with that, um, the next question is, so how do we put these filtering expressions on an FPGA? So how, do we, how, do, how does the corresponding hardware look? Um, so here is, an, here is a, such an expression where I say from the root, I want to match a descendant, which is A, which has a child B, which has a child C, and then that shall have a descendant. That means a descendant means somewhere in the subtree um, an element D. So uh, one, this is a similar problem to regular expression matching. Um, if I, if I, and the regular expression I can express as a non-deterministic finite state machine or a deterministic one. And the example here is a non-deterministic finite state machine where I say, okay, if I match A, I go into the next state. If I match B, I go into the next state. If I match C, then I add a clean closure, meaning I'll stay in this state. Now, I've, I've omitted one thing here on purpose, namely, that's not quite the full story. What is missing is um, we're not keeping track of closing tags here, right? Um, so in XML, we actually have to keep track of once I'm in this state C, once I match A, B, C, those tags are open. When tag C closes again, I have, to, I have to take care of this somehow. And this is typically done with a stack, and I will later show how, how we added this stack um, as an implementation detail into our system. Anyway, if I, if I for now, for simplicity, if I just want to take an, an NFA like this, how can I translate it into hardware? And here I give you an example. So you have what you have on the FPGA is you have flip-flops and you have logic and you have a lot of that. So we can store the states of this non-deterministic finite state machine in a flip-flop. A flip-flop for each state telling me whether this state matched, right? So if I, if I go from Q0 into Q1, then I, and I, I, so when I match this predicate A, then I can put a one into, that, into this flip-flop. And, and with the gates, I basically implement the transitions between all of these states, right? So, so if I, here I'm assuming an external tag decoder. Um, so I'm external, uh, so some black box which sort of reads tags and outputs them. In our implementation, actually, we will have local replicas of tag decoders because that work more efficiently. Um, and so the gates, anyway, they just take the previous state 
um, from the flip-flop and the current tag and then define whether they should go into active state or not. You will need a parser, yes. Um, and I'll come to that in a second. So this here I'm just looking at the, the XPath expression assuming I already have a parser in front of it, yes. Okay. So, uh, so, so, okay, and again, I, I said this now already several times, if we want to now, of course we could compile these XPath expressions into, you know, particular circuits and load them onto the FCJ, but we don't want to do this because this just might take too long. But what we observed is that actually these XPath, so this is a, a restricted set of XPath. We have, for instance, only forward-only um, navigation. Um, so the, the automatons, or these NFAs which we construct, are always of the same structure. They, they, they might change, the semantics might change, um, in the sense that whether I'm matching a tag foo or matching a tag bar. And what also changes is whether I have, uh, whether I'm doing a descendant navigation step or just a child step. But other than that, sort of, the, the, the really the hardware structure um, really stays the, sh this sh stays the, sh the same. So, so we can, we see that we always have pairs of a node test and uh, a navigation step. Yeah? So it's always descendant and A, or child step and B. That's, that's a repetitive pattern. And this we want to exploit exactly for our idea of a skeleton automaton. So this is, this is really the, the key idea behind this approach, namely that you, you define this skeleton, which is the same for all the XPath expressions, and load this on the F, onto the FPGA once. And you leave those parts which are, expa which, are, um, uh, which are specific to, to, to a specific XPath expression. You, you put this on there loader, later. So you just have this skeleton which you load on the FPGA when you boot the engine. And later at runtime, all you have to do from your XPath expressions, you have to just extract uh, the semantics basically and load them into there. And this can be done quickly because all you're doing is, um, you know, updating a little bit of memory. Okay? And again, this should be quick. So you can have highly dynamic workloads uh, and, and, and you can do this. So, so in numbers, you can do this in, you know, two or three microseconds versus um, several minutes of compilation time. So that's the key idea. And from here, I will now, in the next couple of slides, before I go into evaluation, uh, show a little more of the details um, in hardware, because there's some things missing, uh, which I haven't yet um, talked about. So in terms of architecture, you, you, you asked about the parser. So yes, we have a, a parser in front of this. So the, the XML stream runs through this parser, or, or, or it's actually more of a lexer, which um, annotates the data stream with lexicographical information, which is then used by these um, XPath um, circuits, okay? And so this parser reads one byte or one character per, per uh, clock cycle, and it's a, just a large state machine which says, okay, this is the tag start, or this is, um, here is the end of a tag or the end of a closing tag. And then this so-called cooked XML flows through these segment matchers. And this is actually how we're exploiting the parallelism of the FPGA. So it's a pipeline parallelism which we're doing here. So um, we're, we're streaming this data through this pipeline of segment matchers which are daisy chained. And then a small detail here at the end is the serializer that's, uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but that just makes sure that what comes out of this engine is valid XML. Because we, don't, we want the X query engine to be completely oblivious that in front of it an FPGA is filtering out stuff. So we cannot just give it the, the, the matched parts, you know, we cannot just strip everything out of it, which the, uh, so we cannot just give it the parts which the X pass expressions matched. We have to embed it um, in, a, in a valid XML document. So we have to keep the full pass to leave nodes, and that's what this uh, serializer does. 
Okay. So the segment, the skeleton segment, this is now the, this, this is a, as technical as I'll get, is at the core of this. And here is a diagram how, of the architecture of this segment, um, skeleton segment. So again, it represents a navigation step plus a node test. So saying, am I doing a descendant or a child step? And you know, which tag am I matching? Um, so the, the, the configurable parts of this are tag predicate. That's a, I'm going to write in there into a RAM. You know, if I'm matching tag foo, I have to store this in there, right? If I'm matching tag bar, I have to store that information in there. And a, a configuration parameter which says what kind of a, an axis am I doing. And each segment matcher can do both. It can do both or, or all four navigation steps. Um, but, um, and we configure which one to do by writing into this thing. And then you see these matchers have data in and a match in port and the data out and a match out port. So they're all daisy changed. The data f is passed from one matcher to the next, to the next, to the next. And the same holds for the match in and the match out signals. And the segment core takes all of this information and defines whether it has a match or not. And then the final missing part here is this thing here at the bottom, this history unit. And what this is, is this stack, which I mentioned. Um, what we're not taking it into account for if we just look at the regular expression. So if we have a match, we put this into this um, stack. It's a, essentially a one-bit stack. We write a wo one into the air. And as we go down in the tree, we shift. We shift this information to the left. And as we go up into the tree, we shift the other way around. And if it's, a, if it's a child navigation, I'll just shift that one up and down. And if it's a descendant navigation step, I'll, I'll, you know, once I put in a one, I keep shifting in ones. Yeah. And so here we used 16-bit uh, 16, uh, 16 shift registers, so meaning we can go up to a depth of 16. This is reasonable. You, don't, you typically don't have very you know, extremely deep documents. If, if you had, you, you could change this. On the other hand, you could also say, well, if I have an overflow here, then I just, you know, I, I'll, I'll stop filtering. You know, you can say that's always my backup, that I'll just, in the worst case, send you all of the data. Okay. And uh, this is a, a detail about the configuration. How is it done? Um, configuring at runtime, we use for this processing instructions. That's a feature of, is, is a, uh, in the XML specification, and we, the key thing is we embed this configuration also in, into the byte stream. Um, and this can be recognized, and, and then we, we actually configure, you know, as this flows through. And, and in terms of how fast this is, well, we can process one byte per clock cycle. So depending if your X pass, you know, consists of 50 bytes, for instance, then the reconfiguration in terms of throughput is, um, is 50 cycles, which on uh, 125 megahertz clock would translate to 400 nanoseconds. OK. Um, so, so this was all about how to build one, all of the details of how we build a single path. Now, we want to support more than one path. We, we, when we analyze such a query, we typically have something like 15 paths or something like that. Now, we, we don't have to change this architecture to do that a lot. We still keep this chain of segment matchers. And all we have to do is pay a little bit of attention at the beginning and, and at the end of the path. So at the beginning, um, at the beginning, we have to make sure that the segment at the beginning behaves as a, as a, as a root node, basically. Um, and, and that's not difficult to do. Um, the details are you can just initialize this history thing with a one and, and make sure that you, you are not dependent on the predecessor. And the other thing is now uh, the question is, what do multiple paths mean um, for the end result? So here we're saying, 
if either one of these paths match, then we have to keep that part of the document. So, so we want, what we want is the union um, of all of the paths. Um, so we just have an additional global match signal, um, and we can configure a segment at the end of a path. We can say you're an end of chain segment, and so at those segments, what will happen is what you see here in the bottom, um, that the, the previous global match signal is merged together with the local match. So if any one of them has a match at the end, um, it will propagate all the way to, to the serializer thing again, which is responsible for outputting then um, the data. Yes? Path B1 and B2 parallel or it's... Sorry, say again? In your picture you have them in sequence. Are they really sequence or do they work in parallel off with the XML part? So, so they're laid out in sequence. They operate in parallel, but, but path one will match before path two. Um, but, uh, so, so, but if path one matched, together with this data stream, that match will propagate along. So the data just flows through this pipeline, and matching information is merged into the stream, basically. Um, so it's all a sequence operating in parallel. That's what it is, actually. Okay. So, yeah, then this is sort of the, the big picture. We, we have um, this parser and, and, the, and the serializer at the two ends, and then we have um, uh, this chain of segment matchers, and we put as much on there as we can. And, and the FPGA is a, is a 2D array, basically, of resources. And a, a pipeline like this tends to map nicely to the hardware because there's only small neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor communication between the elements, so the tools are very good in figuring out how they can put this there. While with other designs, you, you can construct other more complex um, designs with transitions all over the place, and w which don't work as well. But this one works very well. So a little bit of um, evaluation. Um, first, some performance we, we um, looked at. We, we, we measured the Saxon EE. So Saxon is a, is a, is a Sax-based XML engine or XQuery engine, and the EE is the commercial version. Um, so we, we measured um, the speed up in parsing time on this engine with and without um, this uh, projection. And what you can see is on a 100 megabyte XML um, instance, uh, the speed up was, was uh, around 6x, 6, 8x, somewhere around there. So this speed up in parse time, um, it, it, it was actually significant by reducing the documents. And parse time is indeed really an issue for XML um, applications. In particular, it's something that's not, it's, it's an inherently serial process, um, which is hard to parallelize. And so if you can just make the document which has to be parsed smaller than the, the, the parsing on the XQuery engine, which we didn't change at all, um, will obviously run faster. The benefits in the execution time of the query which we measured were um, not uh, significantly or not significant. This is known about projection. Um, I think the reason is that once you have your optimized data structures in main memory, then the queries run very efficiently um, over these data structures anyway, so they won't touch the stuff which you don't need anyway. Um, so there's no benefit here. In many of the queries, the, the, the execution time was much the smaller part than the parsing time. But you have also in this XMARC benchmark, which is a, is a standard benchmark for XML um, benchmarking, you also have a few uh, expensive join queries where the execution time then dominates. But in most of the queries, the execution time was less dominant than the parse time. And then finally, and this was the original reason for um, projection, uh, memory consumption is again, um, the improvements there are quite significant since you have a smaller document and the, the, the data structures in memory are a multiple of the original document size. So um, often it, it, this really blows up. 
Yes. When comparing, then what you did as a pre filter did you compare with the corresponding software solution or running the entire? Um, uh, yes, I have a, a backup slide on that. Um, yeah, we can. I might as well show this one now. So that's true. Um, Saxon. This is a, um, unfortunately a bit a uh, graph, which is a little bit hard to parse, but. Um, Saxon has a switch, so the commercial version has a six switch for software-based um, projection. Um, so it implements this, and, and uh, we ran this as well. So that's what you see with these striped things here. So this is not, this is not, um, this is not a stacked graph or anything. And the, the message here is, so it has no effect, software pro projection has no effect on, on a parse time. Right, because you, you, the, the document you parse is the same size. Um, execution time, it doesn't have so much of effect anyway. And memory consumption, uh, we were a little bit surprised that uh, the, the, the consum memory consumption improvements from the hardware projection were much more than those from the software projection. No. OK, so I have a few, few more results before I conclude um, this talk. Um, so uh, the, the one thing is about, one question is, well, how many, you know, how much of these segment things can you put on the FPGA? So here we used uh, not a very large FPGA. This was a Xilinx uh, Vertex 5. So it was on the XUP V5 port. So, so uh, how should I say, a, a medium-sized FPGA. And uh, so I, di I didn't talk about how we use VRAM at all. That doesn't matter. But you have, uh, you have basically two types of resources on the FPGA. And we use those sort of in, a, in an uh, equilibrium. And the message is we, we then could put 750 of these segments on the FPGA. And this is sufficient to, to do um, like the, the first 10 um, XMARC queries. Um, so, so, so to, to put this in numbers, maybe to run uh, 10, 15 X paths, which each you, where each is using uh, so, so, something like uh, another 15, uh, or 15 to 30 segments, something like that. So this was, this was uh, sufficient. And the other result that I have is um, scalability. So I said, I said at one point in the talk that this maps well um, to FPGAs. And one way to measure this is to say, how, how does the clock frequency behave? Does it degrade when I start filling up the chip? So at 750 segments, I'm really saturating the chip quite a lot. And what, what you see sometimes is that then the clock frequency really degrades, um, while here it stays more or less stable, which lets us assume that this would also scale to a larger chip very nicely, that we wouldn't have any problems there. And also, this is the clock frequency I'm, I'm showing here is well above our target, which was just 125 megahertz for gigabit. And so this, this brings me to my conclusion. Um, so what I, what I uh, talked about today was um, I was showing a hybrid X query processing engine um, with the approach, the architectural approach of putting the FPGA into the data path. So rather, using, as you, rather than using it as a coprocessor, um, which does heavy number crunching on the side where you have to load, a, load data on there and get a result back, here we put it into the path which exists between um, server or be, between source, so data source, and, and server anyway. And we let it sort of transparently to the, to the X query engine um, process, pre-process the data. And the problem that we encountered was that reprogramming the FPGA in such a setting is not an option because we want to change what we put on the FPGA um, very frequently and very fast. And the result, the, the solution that we came up with for this is to put a skeleton, this, the part which doesn't change for all the queries, put that on the FPGA once. And at runtime, you only change the semantics of it, the, those parts um, um, which are um, specific to a certain query. 
And finally, this, uh, this work is part of our Avalanche research project, um, which you find under this URL. Um, and in this project, we're looking at, we're looking for, we're aiming for um, hybrid CPU FPGA co-designs for data processing. That's our ultimate goal, and we're trying to figure out what are the right abstractions, um, what are the right interfaces um, for this to work well. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Question. So first, um, okay, this is entirely about sort of the programmability of the data path. So how much of an area overhead, how much of research overhead, how much of a, of a uh, clock rate overhead do you expect is caused by, is there a cost associated with making a program, and if so, how long? Ah, okay, I see what you mean. Um, I think in, in, in this particular case, the, the cost, so I don't have an accurate number, but I think it was, is fairly um, small. Um, so, so like the, the navigation step, so, so on the one hand, um, you have a lot of resources there anyway, right? The way that's the way the FPGA is built. So whether you use a multi, an additional multiplexer to decide whether this is going to be a child step or a descendant step, I think that won't have a lot of impact. Um, and, and then, yeah, the, 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 the BRAMs, I mean, we, for instance, we store the, the predicate information, which tag you're matching in BRAM blocks, okay? And again, these blocks, they are there. I mean, I, I mean the question is, what would you do with them? I mean, here we're, we're assuming we can really use the chip um, as we like, there's nothing else we have to do on it. So again, they are there, and I, I don't think, I don't think that uh, like if you would say, okay, I do now a, a solution without this recon, without this um, online reconfigurability. I don't think that you then could say, okay, then I can put ten times more paths on it. I think it would be rather something like, uh, well, I, I'm not even sure if it would be more, but I think it wouldn't be so much more. Was that your question? Well, and actually, I have a second question. If you go back to your um, the uh, area graph, this one, yeah. yeah. Um, so this this is it's not linear. Uh, so I understand why sort of the, the the zero intersection point is not zero because you need some some things just to sort of get the system up. You mm -hmm. need controllers mm -hmm. for the right, right. right. You have the pars aren't the serialize or these things. What is the what is the sort of the the less than one slope caused by the fact that it sort of drops off as you get farther and farther. Well, okay, so I think you're right. It's not linear, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's close. That's, that's my yeah. concern. Well, I think, I think this has to do with the tools. I think that, you know, the more you're filling up this stuff, the tools start doing a better job in, in using the resources. I, I, that's that's my guess here. So you think actually that in the, the, these medium points, like sort of at the 400, what it could be using is actually considerably lower than that. But it's like, well, okay, I have the space, so why not why not expand the field of space? That's that will be my first guess. I mean, that would just be well, the, well, and, and so, that, and so that's the question: is, is is the blow up in synthesis, or is it in place and route? Is I would guess it'd be in place and route. I would guess because it's, you start out with synthesis, synthesize the lot, and then it goes to translate, and then. But, well, no, but the synthesis step sees, oh well, you know, your 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 two percent utilization. Well, okay, then I'm I'm going to double all of these pieces to make them faster because you have plenty of room. Well, there's there. synthesis options to say optimize for area regardless, right? you could try running one of the graphs with all of the Xilinx options set to max area. So yeah, that's true, yeah. 
So I think this here we use the just out of the box options. Uh, I have noticed on other designs I've done that you know you would look to like eighty percent and then keep adding stuff to it. It'll stay at eighty percent, and you know just you know so it is definitely it's finding a quick solution and that's good enough as far as it's concerned. It seems like sometimes it does. Yeah, I mean, the, the routing, all of these steps also take considerably, the, the time it takes to, to uh, produce a final design also, I guess, isn't linear, right? Yeah, sure. 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 But, but, but in general, you see these super linear graphs, not a sublinear yeah, graph, right, right, right. And, that, and that's the thing that caught my eye. If I understand right, your programmability is basically just a special twist in the data path, right? Right. You're going to have your programming token and something special then is there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and everything else is replicated. So the overhead in the core, um, in the core segment, we call it, mm -hmm. programmability, that's the overhead in the core. So if you look at a percent extra in, in the Point-wise, that's that's the same global. You don't have a complicated extra uh, routing network for programming. Mm -hmm. You use the regular streaming network, so that's your only overhead is that. Right. And then you can argue about block grounds versus logic and uh, fixed tokens and mm -hmm. how you recognize the tokens. That, that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Benchmark speed ups too. I noticed you know, there's a couple that really stand out. The 05 and 06, I believe it was, or yeah, yeah if you'll go the next one speed up. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Five and six. Do you know I mean? And it, the shapes of the first and the second are sort of you know. Uh, okay. You know, got, did you did you work into why why some had better speed ups than others? Uh, I mean, not so much. I I know that like I think Q6. Uh, just really a lot of data is filtered. I mean, in the parse time, I think the speed up is really to how much is filtered out, and that's dependent on the query. Um, so the, the queries are progressively harder, evidently, in this graph. Is that right? Uh, well, I've, I don't, I don't know. Almost like a resonance effect or something. You know, yeah, I, I uh, actually, I, I don't remember exactly every query what what it's doing um, in the execution time. Oh no, I don't have these ones here. Yeah, um, so some queries are are join queries, um, which are hard on the execution time, and and some f there's also some queries which, uh, um, yeah, we, we, which you just can't filter out as much because, yeah. But yes. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't have this graph, but um, have a second. I have this information with me. Just have to look it up real quick. Um, so if you have, hope I marked it that I can find it. I don't know. I know it's I know it's in this in this thing, but maybe we have to take it offline offline because I'm not sure if I can spot it right away. Um, I think it was something like uh, between uh, 15 and and 73, um, and and the median. I don't know anymore what we have for a median. So I have a lot of numbers in here. But I think that was it was something like that. Yeah. Um, I think the part of the interesting thing of this is of this, this approach is that, that in turn, for complexity reasons, right? So the system will never say, for complexity reasons, I, I can't support your thing. Right? There's right. always this fallback of whatever you bring, I'm I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna right. pass yeah. on directly right. to the right. Um So I, I'm. I, have, I know nothing about sort of the, the, the this, you know, XML query or mm -hmm. what have you. So, uh, is there anything like that in, 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 in the language that you just simply can't support? Uh, in X query language? Yeah, right. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of stuff which we which we would have troubles to. Okay. Um, there's. And so you know, uh, what I mean, fraction of the elements. Is I, I mean, support? sorry. I mean, just to make sure that I got the question right. You mean support on the FPGA, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, what fraction of those types of things are actually in the benchmarks? Uh, I, I, I assume that there's you know whatever, however large. Uh, this is one suite, and there's probably some other suites. So how much of that actually gets expressed, and how much of that is actually built into the runtime of, of, of you know, the performance limit? I mean, I, I think uh, fairly a lot gets expressed. I mean, take you know they have they're doing joins, for instance, uh, that would be difficult to do in an FPGA. Um, you know, there's a. Uh, back references, you know, from a child back to a parent. Again, here on on our X passings, we only this works well because we only have forward. We only go down the tree in the past. We never have then when we're in a child a reference up to a parent or to, or a parent of the parent or stuff like that. I mean, you can do X query is, is a language which allows you to basically express anything. Um, it has function calls and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and so there's, there's a variety of things which we couldn't put on an FPGA. But yeah. based on the, the performance numbers, they're there, but they may not be a significant part of, of, of the overall. So if you switch to, for example, your, your execution time, uh, I mean, those, the, the, the six and seven that barely make it to two, I mean, at best, uh, you're doing. You're making. You're making the job half as difficult. Right. Um, right. I, I, I really think that the, the 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 reason for this is that you know once you once you build up your main memory data structures. Sure. 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 If they run, they run the, uh, the, the filtering effect. The, the the effect of filtering on a query execution is just not that great. Yeah. So in the flexing <coughs> part. In other words, feed it tokens one, two, three instead of the strings. Aha, so, 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 so um, doing, doing this before the FPGA, so like binary XML or something like that. Uh, no, we haven't, we haven't looked into that. So, the of was 90% of the time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this, yeah. Then, then I don't know how parsing, parsing speed up would change with binary XML. That's actually an interesting thing as an as an extension to this to to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is also that, that you're doing this lexing and, and, and the computation in a pipeline fashion, so it's all going on in sort of parallel. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's also nothing that says that you couldn't run the entire system coarse grain in parallel. And just say, okay, I'm gonna. I have one parser and one and, and one serial and one series of sequence matches, and then I'm just gonna run a whole a whole separate. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's no real way of sort of parallelizing within because the sequence matches are already sort of parallel. Yes. In the sense that they're all sort of looking for different things. Um, I mean, the, yeah, I guess the other thing is that, that this this is interesting because this. Because the problem statement allows you to basically make uh, one long pipe and cut off wherever you want. And it's like getting a garden hose, cut the length, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you want, if but if you needed to be able to produce sort of parallel outputs, where it's it, this is interesting because I don't care which one you matched. All I know is that you, something in this thing matches. So that means I have to take this entire sort of half down right. to to this element and, and take it and, and put it on the output. Um, but if you couldn't, if you had to figure out which one it came from, you have some idea of how you would actually then maintain that at some you know, cut to length. Well, kind of well, which one it came from, I think, I think that could be could be done by adding. You you would have to then add this information into the stream, um, but you you would then. I guess you would have to then stop the previous one, add in yours, and this would sort of, you know, the, all of these that matched, would, you know, you would add up this kind of information. The, 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 uh, the problem is, is so the, then you know which one it came from if you want to know this. Um, the problem is if you want to route, if, if now your problem is like such that you say, okay, 
this doesn't all if if, if pass one match then I want to you know then I want to send that data over there if pass two match I want to send it to somebody else then you have there a problem of you know if all of them match you have to send them to all of them and you know you how do you do that but then that's a different problem yeah so um, uh, I think uh, go ahead so uh, so the what is the query engine you're running to evaluate export the query engine is a Saxon here, and what? So is it based on like query plans, just like regular SQL, or how does it evaluate them? I'll, I'll get my question before. So currently the design is sort of clean in the sense that input is XML, mm -hmm. the output is again well-formed XML. Right. Yeah. So in principle you can store it and then again right. feed it to query. Right. But if the query engine is sort of operator-centric, mm -hmm. and what you're doing is something like a filter, analogous to a filter, right. maybe you can feed the output of this straight to the operator that will consume a filter rather than making it well well formed document sure. and again passing it sure i mean yeah if you if you're willing to to uh, modify your engine you can do a lot more also we're parsing twice basically i mean we're parsing on the fpga and we're parsing again on the engine you you know you could use this lexical graphical information which we have maybe already for a final parser but then you have to modify the engine so your design point was you didn't want to modify the right. query engine, and that gets back to the binary XML suggestion you're doing. Oh, okay. Right. I was wondering, you could say something more about the automata that you get. Yeah, from the example, I understood that they, uh, uh, and I was sort of thinking that, do they always look like this? Do you have sort of some closure at the beginning, and then you check, you know, some occurrence or some tags, and then it ends with a closure again? Mm -hmm. or, or is it sort of more more complicated, and then uh, in relation to that, does the when you say so, what you mean by semantics is you know, different labels, right? So language right. theoretically, you right. plug in different right. actual labels, then you get different mm -hmm. semantics and language theoretically. Exactly. Uh, but of, of course, if you choose choose different uh, labels, you might actually get uh, a non-determinism. The skeleton, which you perhaps didn't have on the terminals, the other way around. Just wondering if, once you fix the skeleton, mm -hmm. uh, does the effect of what, how you choose the semantic the, the labels uh, have consequences, or, or are there sort of okay. constraints in that sense? Okay. Um, so, so first of all, yes, this is um, not, you know, th this is a. A specific type of non-deterministic finite state machine. So it's one where 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 you um, where you have this forward-only um, path, and um, so here the the predicates that we are supporting here are always just tag names. Yeah? Um, if we wanted to, so we we also had some. Uh, well, we didn't evaluate it thoroughly, but we also thought, how would you do more complex predicates where you say, OK, I'm also looking at attributes. I'm taking, I only want to look at those items which have an age attribute which is larger than 50. Um, I think the, the concept is the same, but it makes this predicate matcher thing more complex, right? You have to then convert strings to binary and do the comparator. So um, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, it's, it, if you, as long as you don't support stuff like back references from child, from a child back to the parent, and so I think you you won't have um, anything that you cannot handle. And in particular, the, I mean, the non-determinism that you have here is 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 not a problem because you you do all of this in parallel. Um, so 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 while what I want to say is if if I have an a non-deterministic state machine in software, and now I have, I have a lot of active states, then suddenly this can become a, a performance bottleneck, right? Um, because I have to update all of these parallel states on one single input item. While in hardware, I don't care how many states are active, I, I, I operate them all in parallel anyway. So, you would get A, but you you might be in Q0, or you might be in Q1. Right. So the, the choice is sort of open. Exactly, and that it's doesn't... Real state, so like a subset of states that are active. Yes. At the same time, it doesn't blow up. And, and, and because each state is, is an individual circuit, um, that's fine. Each state just, just 
you know, looks for himself, and, and the overall result is correct. You know, I don't. No. No. So if you go back to your sort of performance plan, um, I'm, I'm wondering about basically the Andal's law part here. Okay. Um, so it, uh, the, you have these things broken out as being sort of the speed up in one that segment and the, the speed up in the other thing. Mm -hmm. How much time do I spend in each? So what's the, what's the wall thought? So if I put this graph together with the other graph, right, if I said what's my parse and execute time speed Okay, up, yes. Uh, uh, th th this one is a uh, is very query depend dependent. Like I said, um, you know, in, in a lot of these queries, uh, you you know you can just maybe stack them on top of each other. But there's there's in this benchmark also a few queries like long joins where where really the query execution time is dominant. So so there's a few um, a few I don't know if it was Q Q10 or whatever where. Um, where you know you would be then 40 seconds, for 40 seconds joining, right? So there, there you would get a very different picture. So could you give me some estimate as to the average? Yes. Uh, okay. Now I get to, <laughs> again. I should have used the. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I can do this. So. Um, If it's in the paper, I'll read it. I'll just, uh, no, no, here, here. So, so here you go. Actual query execution time varied between 68 milliseconds and 41 seconds. And the median over these was 390 milliseconds. And this, this versus uh, parse time of 2.5 seconds, okay, just to put this in proportion. And, and the speed up is, yeah, what you... Because you have 700 segments, you use at most half of 100. So you could have seven of these engines in one of these here. So you could run seven of those queries in parallel, provided that. Seven queries in parallel? Yeah, provided two things A, that the engine on the other side understands how to query it, and B, that the ratio between input data and output data is one to seven at least. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so with this, there is yes, I think yes, but there's one issue, um, namely, um, how do you? So when we when we just load the X pass, all of the X pass for for one query onto the FPGA, we basically swipe and then append all of the path, right? So now if you have multiple in parallel, okay, you could do this, but now one query terminates, you take this out, you leave the other ones there, you you have a, a hole. So you would if you would do batches. Of queries in parallel, I'd say yes. But you, if you just want to, you know, okay, I, I have six queries are still running, but here I finished one. Now I'm going to send the next one. There would be an issue of, of uh, you know, of allocating, uh, allocating this thing in a proper manner. And, and the other thing is then, of course, you have to also decide on, okay, you could always union all of these queries. But then the filtering effect, of course, goes down because the queries might not look at the same data. Um, so, so, so that's another issue, you know. Are you saying more partition than design? So the first seven, you wouldn't be running one query and the next seven, you run the next I mean, I'm sure they, in fact, the deployment, you have a multiple independent query that you want to run. Right. And this scheme just says, OK, so the first, the second, the third. You have plenty of space. Why can't I use one chip? So I'm sure, I can have multiple yeah. PCs also. How many, how many, how many, uh, how many queries would you be running on the same document? No, no, no. But then it becomes no, no, a question of partitioning it up to run the multiple to parallel. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, you also need then a different. You need multiple parsings, M multiple, multiple parsing engines. Yes, the whole thing is what we get seven times. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's not seven, six, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, but, but being Absolutely. able to you, that would mean that you would have to partition the system, have insertion points where you can sort of yeah, break the to, cars into, into multiple cars. You know, that would break be the, one car into two cars, or put two cars and make one car, right? So Yeah, but maybe the same point is a program, is a program engine one program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But the, yeah, there's a certain granularity, right? Yes. Yeah. You probably also have to uh, increase your I.O. 
as well. And I'm assuming if you ran seven of these at a time, the mm -hmm. input output would become the bottleneck pretty quickly. Well, so see, so that's a different input. Doesn't change. Oh, oh you're, you're saying, saying it's the same input. It's, it's the same, same doc. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so assuming that the speed up is roughly proportional to the amount of data that you're getting. compressing it, then yeah. you could just feed all of those seven outputs on the same. If you output. compress a factor of seven, then that you have fit. Yeah, that's true. That's that's interesting. Problem. Yeah, uh, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.